Welcome back, everyone, to the Fly Culture Podcast. We're going to do something a little bit different today. That I'm going to talk to some friends. It's not one guest. It's not two guests. We got three guests today, and we're going to talk about fly fishing. And it feels to me as though we could be in some sort of a golden age, perhaps, of fly fishing, in that we're seeing increasing numbers of anglers join. So I'm told um, our ranks, which is wonderful news. Um, technology as well with rods lines materials for fly tying um, we're seeing handling of fish improving um, and more people are joining as i said we still got a downside with pollution as well but it seems to me as though anglers are becoming more vocal on that as well and these are the sorts of things that i talk with friends with all the time and i thought it might be interesting for our listeners to listen in in a conversation between a bunch of friends um, talking about these sorts of issues and we don't really know where we're going to go with this so it'll be quite a interesting one and as I often do go down a rabbit hole with with topics and we're going to try and see if we can pull this one up but I really hope that you find this um, as interesting and looking forward to it as much as I am but my guests today I think none of them need any real introduction but I'm going to do so anyway um, I've got Paul Proctor here um, dry fly maestro uh, fly casting master writer just all round fisherman and good guy. Um, I've got Yeva Bretti Ieta, who is just out on the water all the time. Is such a great advert for fly fishing at the moment. She seems to fish every minute that she possibly can. And Andy Buckley as well, fishing guide. Um, and Andy and, and Yeva as well um, do a really interesting YouTube channel, which if you haven't checked it out already, you should have a good look at that as well, where they cover so many fishing topics, advice, independent reviews which is really important and interesting as well um so i think we've got some a really interesting mix of people to talk to today and i thought um first off i guess i want to thank everyone for taking the time to talk with me but i thought what we'd start with is is tackle first off and it seems to me that technology like i said in the introduction seem to have leapt on and on at the moment and fly rods we're seeing a movement in fly rods now, and we've talked about these on the, the podcast previously, from those stiffer rods where we were popping fish to more progressive medium action rods. Um, and I can't see that we've got, you know, we've got incredibly light rods now. Um, and, and we're seeing, I don't know if rods can go any further than there actually are at the moment. It'll be kind of interesting to see that. And what sort of, to me, backs that up is that you're seeing people sort of regress a little bit in the sense of looking at bamboo rods a little bit more, um, at, uh, glass rods a little bit more as well. And I wonder if that's the case. And I thought this first question would be a really interesting one for Paul, because obviously you've been involved with rod design with the rods that you do at Mackenzie and having fish and caught fish with them that they're kind of interesting that that sort of fits in with that, that the action of the rod is designed to cast the line really well, but also to play the fish. Where, where, where do you feel about rods, um, Paul, at the moment? And do you think there's further to go for them? Is there another direction they need to go in? Um, well, first up, yeah, you, you've, uh, you've nailed it there, Pete. It's easy to uh, design a fishing rod for for us as individuals, if you were going to design one, you'd t arguably tailor make one for yourself. I could for my um, my sort of skill set. I mean, the difficult part is we're all individuals and we're all at different places and casting subjective that we all get a different sensation from it. Um, so try to design or uh, build rods to sort of... Um, be general purpose to suit everybody is very, very difficult. I mean, uh, I, my God, I lost some sleep over that, I'll tell you. Um, you. You go, you put different lines through them, you do this, you do that, you tweak them, blah, blah, blah. But I was very keen to dial it back in terms of uh, more forgiving action. Um, certainly from, um, to me, obviously, um, it's chicken, egg, chicken and egg situation. Obviously, you've got to get that fly to, to the fish in the first place before it eats and then you hook it and then you play it. But um, I guess as a generalization, slightly stiffer rods are easier to cast just simply because they don't buckle. Uh, if, if, if you just slightly overpower or too much acceleration on the cast, they don't buckle and lose that straight line path that we're always trying to achieve with the rod tip. 
Uh, however, if you make a rod too stiff, as you said in um, leading up to the question, it's so much easier to ping off on fish. So I, I definitely lean to more forgiving rods. I feel happier um, with them. And it's just about altering your casting as well uh, in terms of we've gone pretty much middle of the road with the Mackenzie rods um, in terms of they, they still deliver the fly well, still perform in breezy conditions. I took took them when we were developing them, some of the prototypes down to New Zealand, Iceland, them places, maritime climate, just like the UK, very, very windy. Um, so it's, it, it was a good grounding, a good testing ground for them. Um, but it is for me, the key thing is a more forgiving rod or one that will yield, um, not just on big fish, but a lot of our fishing now, one, one advancement I've seen or understanding people are, are seem to be getting head round it's getting much closer to the quarry. And when you're hooking your fish that bit nearer and development in no stretch fly lines, et cetera, et cetera, there's got to be some give in the system somewhere. And we, we put that in the rods. Nice. Interesting. Yeva, I'd like to ask you the similar question, but also one of the other things I was thinking about and where I'm going with this a little bit with rods as well is that in the technology of, of moving those on. And what we've seen is where companies have tried to change handles, for example, and Reddington had a wind grip handle on their rods which is a company that made golf club handles i loved it i thought it was great i think loop have brought a rod with a, a substitute handle as have i think uh which did as well um do you think these things and, and it seems to me as though that those things have disappeared again do you think these things will um continue to evolve or do you think it's going to take a long time for that to happen yeva i have no idea Absolutely no idea. Literally. I don't think uh, I was saying to end as well. For me, I only been exposed to the modern perfected stuff. So I don't know how you guys were casting the old bamboo rods or how you're feeling. Probably it was not as good. I'm assuming but I have no idea. I will pass it on to you. <laughs> you pop that one over now. Shifting so, it over. So, so yeah, it's, it's been interesting actually with the there's a lot of companies tried that with the handles, haven't they? That everyone's trying to get away from cork because it's getting more scarce and more expensive. Um, but we we live and work in an industry that is pretty traditional and quite slow to change. And it just feels like every time someone tries a composite handle or a different handle like the wing grips, it never quite sticks. You're absolutely right. Uh, partly maybe driven by the aesthetic of it. I mean, actually, I'm going to pop this back over to Procky for a second and say in the design process on Mackenzie, was there ever a thought to say, why don't we use something other than cork? Uh, I don't think there was a conscious one when we were at the uh, factory and playing around with tapers. We did see them. Uh, there was quite a few sort of innovative things there, which um, I'm not at liberty to... <laughs> to really talk about um but um it, it really wasn't it wasn't a conscious decision either way we just went with what what we had at the time but yeah i mean you've got a point there regarding uh cork becoming more scarce etc cetera, etc cetera. there will be a time when we've got to change and one of the classics for me was uh not too long ago we were we all uh with wading boots had felt soles and consequently now we're into all this new sort of uh, technology. And, and as it's turned out, it's far superior, far superior in, in many respects, not just grip, but harder wearing. And obviously then there's the sort of uh, ecological impact, if you like, whereby we're not transferring uh, spores from river to river or anything like that. So again, that, that was a hard one to turn around. I can remember there was quite... Um, you know, a kickback from uh, the angling community, like, oh, you know, this newfangled sort of rubber soles and things like that. But, but that that's taken hold now, and I, I would I would like to think in time it will change. But you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it appears that in fly fishing, tradition rules or okay care kind of thing. And that's on a wider basis as well, isn't it? Because if we look, let's take the Reddington rod for example. When it first came out, it was red. And that clearly didn't work. And then there was a black one and then it came to back to cork again. And I think that's kind of interesting. It tells you that's the, you know, Reddington are operating in the biggest marketplace in America 
and that hasn't worked for them, which I think is kind of interesting. So it, it, even in a more probably a more progressive marketplace than our one, it seems as though they were not quick to adopt those changes. And that's where I wonder with the rods themselves as well, how much further they can be pushed. And I know we've got banana rods or other products, but whether the those sort of things will be um, adopted by anglers, it, it seems as though that's going to be a long drawn out process. I think we can all agree on that, can't we? Uh, yeah, I would think so, Pete. Certainly, certainly on rods. I mean, um, consumables like tippet material, fly lines. We all seem hungry for the latest technology, and uh, I've got to have it. You know, this newfangled tippet material. Blah blah blah. You know, I mean, you and I are from a day, Yeva probably won't. Uh, you know, w where we had good old fashioned uh, nylon, and it, it rots. You know, I mean, today's uh, fly fishers. I've got core polymers and fluorocarbons and blah, 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 you know, super thin. We, I grew up with Maxima and things like that, you know, at least. Um, yeah. so, but uh, them consumables, it's like new hook patterns for fly tying, um, new materials. Um, like I said, the tippet materials, we're, we're on it. But you do something with a rod and it's, ooh, ooh, no, we can't have that kind of thing, you know. It, isn't that strange? You, you, you know, yeah. thinking about it. Yeah, it's a really interesting one, and it it does take time, and it probably takes people like yourselves that people see you using that, that that actually ultimately gives them a bit more confidence. And if you guys are reviewing it, or Paul, if you've written about it, then that probably has a little bit more credence with with people. It was interesting. Um, you mentioned that, Paul, because I put a picture out on my social media this morning, and it was 25 years ago, and I was fishing in Colorado. And the, the, the waders I had were sort of just about nice, breathable. Um, the sunglasses looked like I was... Yeah, we'll leave that. Um, and even I had felt souls on exactly right, you know, and, and how things even in that period of time have changed quite dramatically. Um, it's been kind of interesting to see. And it, it almost feels as though these changes that we're getting right now are happening instantaneously almost, or it, perhaps it's, it isn't, but it kind of feels as though those things are happening pretty quickly. And it, it brings me back really to fly lines and how we're seeing those adapted. And I, I know um, Paul and I, when we started, and probably yourself, Andy, as well, um, that was really double taper and wait forward. And I remember buying a shooting head and thinking, putting that on my rim fly, and wow, you know, I couldn't, I didn't know what to do with it the first time I, I cast it. It was extraordinary. And just sort of went, went from there and how those things have changed. But I think one of the things, and I know we'll probably all agree, is... Um, fly lines are just so important and it's such an important aspect of our fishing and having this wide range of fly lines that allow us to fish in a, a varied way um, for our species if it's a small stream if it's a reservoir wherever it is allows us to do that that's a, that's a good thing Andy yeah absolutely yeah you're absolutely right it is so important um, when I was working in Farlow someone would come in and they'd say I want a new uh, trout fishing outfit I fish the test store the usk or wherever and I would actually start from the fly end and work backwards and actually the last thing we bought was the reel because the reality is probably the least important part of the entire rig but actually the the tippet leader fly line for me is the crucial part of that if if you're a uh, leader and tippet and your fly line will work in properly your presentation is going to be better you'll be able to throw a slightly longer leader and the, the progression in fly lines, uh, certainly since I've been fishing, as, as you say, you, you had the option of a weight forward or a double taper. Your weight forward landed like a brick. Um, you double taper once you got 40 feet of it out was always too heavy. But the, the change, the development in modern tapers, particularly for the presentation angler, but also maybe for people like predator anglers who have now got these very, very short, very heavy heads. Um, that's and that's just in single handed casting. Once you go into double handed casting, all of a sudden we've got skagits and scandies and motips, and it's moved on a huge amount. Even the last 10 or 15 years, the progression's been phenomenal. And it, all this stuff just makes the process of going out and having a day's fishing a little bit easier and a little bit more pleasurable. And I think that's what this is about, and that's why we have this progress to try and help people to make this fishing a little bit easier and a bit more enjoyable. 
And Yeva, have you noticed that since you <laughs> since you've come to fishing, Yeva, have you noticed that as well? That um, from a casting point of view, um, for the sort of fishing, and I guess you're primarily river fishing, that the the line and rod combinations that you're using are allowing you to load that rod really quickly without the need to force cast too much. Oh. I always laugh when I see someone um, do 24 casts to cast out two rod lengths. Why the excess energy? You're going to get exhausted so much. But um, just to touch on the point what Andy was saying, I find it more confusing having that many options yeah. because you look online if I'm going to go and pick a line and if I'm not an expert in it and you have a hundred options on one website, how in the world are you ever going to know which one to buy? I find it really difficult. I don't think it's explained well enough, even on the flying lines itself. I don't know. Um, but yeah, definitely, we. I guess we cast a bit differently. I slightly uh, overline my uh, reel and my rod. So the casting is always easier for me to turn over 20 feet of tippet on the river Y. Um, I don't know how it would have been on a bamboo rod, probably a lot more difficult. Yeah. And, and Paul, that's interesting, isn't it? Because initially on rivers that would be the standard sort of thing that we would do wouldn't it certainly for the little streams i'm fishing here would go up a line weight but now we've got lines and i think of the ones that rio do but also you know i think mike barrio led the charge with a lot of this with designing lines appropriate for that sort of fishing um and it's been kind of interesting to see that development now hasn't it and and how those things have changed yeah, well, you and I, Pete, being that little bit older, we're in that revolution where fly lines were coming out that were um, weighted uh, half a line size heavier, i.e. a six weight would come in technically in grains at a six and a half weight. And that was principally, uh, and again, this was on the back of those really stiff rods because people couldn't feel or, or sometimes bend the rod um, uh, and consequently putting a or overlining the rod just gives it a better sensation. Uh, I, I tend to stay um, sort of true to it, i.e. a four-weight four line on a four-weight rod and just rely on tip speed um, to project, project at short range. And again, that's where softer rods win the day because almost under their own inertia, they'll flex to maintain that straight line path. Uh, we discussed earlier, which again, uh, you know, fiberglass and bamboo uh, absolute classics for. Um, I often I've got a couple of uh, bamboo rods, and you know, I have days when I just go out and yeah, the heavier. Um, I mean, not massively heavier and weight, but in in uh, in terms you mentioned at the beginning, really light fly rods. I'm digressing a wee bit, but. That's subjective. I'd rather have a slightly heavier outfit that was balanced well with reel and, and rod and when the line's out, as opposed to one that if you've got uh, a long rod with a really light reel on, it feels tip heavy and, and you're fighting it all day long and it, it, it just feels wrong. So to me, the, the key thing is a balanced outfit. Um, but yeah, in terms of fly lines, just on the back of what Yeva said, I mean, I've been fishing for 40 odd years and I just, these days I can't keep up. There's new lines out, blah, blah, blah. And how, how many different tapers do we need? I, you know, I get that we do need certain tapers and the predator ones and the ones with the weight in the back of um, the head section for spare casting, et cetera. Get, kind of get all that, but it, it, it is getting silly. It's getting to a point of, you almost feel like, Jesus, to go fishing, I'm going to need four different lines, you know. <laughs> one for headwind, one for sidewind, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I, I, am, I am kind of showing my age a wee bit. I like a good old, honest sort of, no, I wouldn't say traditional weight forward, but uh, a weight forward uh, line with quite a long, uh, delicate front taper. One of the best for me, they don't do it anymore, was the Mastery XPS. I love that line. I love, in fact, I bought a few up and I've still got some still brand new ones boxed in a black plastic bag hidden away in a cupboard to come out one day. Um, nice. Really love that. Line. Really love that line. Yeah. Yep, I used to fish those too. And it's interesting what Andy said about, you know, weight forwards in those early stages landing like a pile of spanners. And I, I wonder if there's still a misconception 
um, and particularly what you've just said, Paul, as well, a misconception that double taper lines are more delicate on the water because, as we all know, we could we could design a weight forward fly line, as you've said, with a delicate front taper. It doesn't matter, does it, really? And we're talking from that river point of view. It doesn't matter if it's weight forward or double taper, that if we design that delicate front taper, that doesn't matter, does it? Absolutely not. And then, you know, you can talk about balance. You then talk about the, um, your leader setup. That that can take a massive amount of sting out of what is potentially um, a mediocre fly line, if, if I dare say that. But case in point, and we've all done it, uh, and I see people do it um, when I'm at events and people are trying rods, and they take a rod out and they don't even put a tippet on. And I'm saying, what are you doing? You, you need that just to just to dissipate that energy. Otherwise, it just comes to the end of the fly line. And we've all done it and it just goes bounce like that, you know. And But, but you can make, like I said, uh, a, a mediocre, if, if I'd like, um, you know, uh, make, make a mediocre fly line um, perform beyond expectation just purely by... Um, your leader on on the end of it and how you build that and what you use for it you know yeah no absolutely it's interesting uh you say about the weight forward and the early and you mentioned the early weight forward lines and i remember casting in the garden here with one of them and i was casting and it was at one of those stages it was before i was working in professionally and i was just casting and that stupid thing that you pull as much off the reel as you possibly can and i did some more and i did some more and then i was casting and then I made my next cast and I thought, Pete, you've lost it. You can't cast anymore. What's happened? And it turned out I'd cracked the whole head off the weight forward part and I've never found it. <laughs> right. 30 years ago, I've never found it. I don't know where it went. It must have been traveling with such high velocity that it's traveled into Cornwall somewhere because I've never found it. So I, I broke the head off the, the weight forward. I don't know how I did it. I had a leader on, but that, that story that you mentioned, Paul, made me think of that. But that, that is kind of interesting. But um, I want to move on as well, because to me, one of the really key things that we've seen in our fishing and we might bring CDC into this, but Yeva, I wanted to throw this to you is tungsten beads. And I know you guys are doing great stuff and I missed your initial offering that you're tying some flies for people um, to help them with their grayling fishing with tungsten beads and things. Do you think, um, Yeva, that tungsten beads are just such a important thing to have in your armory these days? Well, as in you, you do you mean tungsten beads as in itself or just nymphs? In, in the nymph side of it, yeah, and, and how they've affected and how they've helped your fishing and enabled you to reach those deeper sections of the river that perhaps you may not have been able to reach before? Uh, I don't know. It's a difficult one for me because I, I really like nymphing and I keep saying I really like nymphing. And then we went out the other day and I realised that I barely do any nymphing. I, mainly, if I can, I will do the dry fly. Um, I think it's definitely a good thing to get down as fast as as you can to the deep water especially if you're fishing for grayling um yeah i don't know it's definitely uh i don't know if you guys did you used to have tungsten beads before like that's the thing for me i came into having everything laid out for me as best as perfected as possible so when you say, oh, do you like tungsten beads? Like, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you always have tungsten beads? What would you have otherwise? Uh, and that's a really interesting point of, about what we've been talking about, about this potential golden age or this really great moment in fly fishing that we've got these things that we can 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 play with and and Paul I you know we'll come on to yourself and then Andy's going to tie up but I remember CDC when that first came which is another I think in my humble opinion game changer and I remember catching fish on it and then thinking what the hell do I do with it now do you do yeah. you remember those those moments I, absolutely well can, can I just add to 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 the tungsten bead sort of revolution mm. I'm I'm Obviously, because we're, we're in lockdown in spring, I, w I was time for people, and I am just now, and everybody wants, uh, with the grailing season, wants tungsten bead nymphs and things like that. And, yeah, I mean, there's two ways of looking at it. I mean, the, the tungy beads certainly get your flies down quickly. The more compact you can build, more delicate or construct more delicate flies. 
However, the, often, and this is something I learned from um, places like Slovenia and Bosnia, sometimes fish shy away from a, a, a nymph that's plummeting like too quickly. And you've got to back off. I tie with brass beads as well, just for a slightly lighter nymph and some even unweighted nymphs. And yeah, you can almost use your, your, your tongue as a sacrificial nymph and tether uh, an unweighted uh, nymph two foot away and just just let that flutter about. I seem to know a hell of a lot about nymphing, given that I'm some kind of dry fly geek, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> I remember us fishing when this Euro style stuff had came out, and we were on the Wiley, weren't we? And it was early, it was cold, yeah. um, and we'd both those things were starting to happen, weren't they? And we were both fiddling around with it, and then I remember us coming meeting. At, we, I think we were fishing a short distance apart, and then you being left hand left-hander and me a right-hander fishing side by side up the river just fishing i think we ended up fishing a duo and stuff didn't we and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and doing those sorts of stuff so it's kind of interesting but andy what do you think about um tungsten beads cdc those sorts of bits and pieces well i, I think i think the whole fly tying industry again it's constantly changing every time you every time you log on to a social media platform there's a new material Again, all this stuff is making things easier. I think for me, one of the most important, um, certainly in the time that I've been tying flies, has been how much better the threads have got. Um, I, I tie almost all of my flies now on nano silk. And the, the, it's just so bloody strong for its diameter and it's, it's so bulkless. Uh, it's so much easier to tie a, a smaller fly these days just because I feel like the threads have got so much better. And I, I started on you know, Gordon Griffith's shear in 16 you know, and you know, you pull, you pull your whip finish half an ounce too hard and the whole thing snaps and you start again. Um, but that, that's gone now. So again, this, this progression to try and make uh, tying easier, particularly with tungsten, the weight to get yourself down a little bit easier. These are all progressions that are just there to try and make the process a little bit more straightforward for people. And as, as you ever says, coming into uh, what you've described, Pete, as kind of a golden age of fly fishing, it's probably a little bit more straightforward than it was you know when when you guys started fly fishing definitely when i started fly fishing i think everything is a little bit more simple now all of this stuff has been tailored towards making the experience a bit more pleasurable it's interesting we'll come back onto the tying thing um and i've sort of come round about in my i'm not even time flies at the moment i'm buying them because i just don't seem to feel any urge to want to tie any i've stripped a load of one of my lockdown jobs was to strip a load of old nymphs that i'd found and perhaps get retying them again but i've found now that I'm, I'm almost regressing back towards the good old pheasant town nymph and then variations thereof in do you think we've got almost too many materials um do we need as much as we do to represent and do we need to make sure we know what we're actually rather than tying we know about hot spots we know about hackles we know about do we need to make sure that we have a good understanding of the bugs that we're trying to represent as well paul well I, i'm obviously going to say yes to that because that that's what i grew up with again um we're talking about this golden age and it we, it is uh, really is a golden age. Um, in many ways, I, I'm very envious of those coming into fly fishing because the information is just fingertips away on a device, isn't it? Um, when we were, you know, Tinker Blobby wasn't around when we were nippers and growing up and, you know, you, you just learnt your trade and how I did it, I, I used to keep, I, I think you know this, Pete, um, and he always kind of gets a laugh if I'm at, at, at talks and things. I'm, I'm really keen on uh, on the inverts and what trout and grayling feed on. Yeah, principally for an understanding of that, but also for going forward, the environment and looking after the environment, which is key. I mean, they're, they're the absolute fabric of the whole river system, not just the fish that live in the river, but as we know, all, all the creatures, you know, pied wagtails, grey wagtails, dippers, kingfishers, otters, blah, blah, blah. All them ultimately are there because inverts are at the bottom of the food chain. Um, but understanding them for me, I used to keep fish tanks and go and catch bugs and watch them hatch and things like that. It came to an end one day when a caddis hatch was in full swing in the living room. Um, <laughs> <I> had, <laughs> 
I kid you not, I, I was kind of uh, ordered ordered outside with, with, with my wee fish tanks and things like that. But you learn so much. Here's an interesting thing. Carixa, um, they're strigitate. Strigitation is what grasshoppers do when they rub their legs together and make that noise. Carixa can strigitate. I think they do it with the wing case. And the only thing I can, uh, you know, I'd hear this little sort of noise uh, when I was sat watching TV and thinking, where the devil's that noise coming from? It came from the fish tank and it was blinking Carixa. And I think they do that either to communicate or sort of, look, I'm living in, this is my little domain to, to other Carixa nearby, you know, but... Um, I found it fascinating, and that that gave, that gave me the great grounding. And I am I am sort of biased because, for me, having that and understanding what you tie into or what you want to represent, and and th thereafter how you present it is is ultimately key to my fishing. And uh, you know, well, in essence, that is fly fishing, isn't it? That that is it. Yeah. And Yeva, do you find that it's easy to get that sort of information on the bugs now? But also, how do you feel? Do you like that there's many materials that we can find to represent bugs or to have those trigger points? Is that That's a good thing, yeah? So what I usually do is I never follow any kind of recipes. I will see, I will be watching video on YouTube or... Um an instruction of how to tie a fly and I will just look for something that looks the sim like the most similar to what they're using. I don't care what it's called or what size it is, as long as it's approximately um at least remotely similar to what I needed. And I think that's how I came up with uh, my olive upright when I tied straight after lockdown or during lockdown is I was watching loads of olive upright videos of how to tie them and then I was like right I need to I need this yellow dubbing I don't care what kind it is. I don't care what brand it is. As long as the fly looks remotely similar and the sizing of the fly is good, the hackle is good, it will look buggy, that's fine. But I'm not an expert in fly tying, to be honest. I can't really say anything. That's a really interesting approach because that's what we would have done in our day. And so there wasn't so much to play with. So you would do that. And there wasn't an easy way to find what a pattern was. I guess you, you found out if a pattern worked, if it caught fish or not. So that's kind of, to me, is a really interesting approach to it. And, yeah, I, I kind of like that. But, Andy, over to you. What do you think about these things? Do you think we have too many materials? Do you think we have too many patterns? Do you think the subtleties are too subtle now? What, where, do, where are you with this? So I'm, I'm probably sat somewhere between both camps. I mean, absolutely, yeah. The entomological side of things is really, really important. Um, but the reality is, if, if we're talking about a nymph here, your pheasant tail. If we're talking about a pheasant tail, if you have a box of pheasant tails ranging from size 12 to size 20, you could probably imitate 50% of all the insects or all the inverts at the bottom of a river. So we know you don't need to go, you know, too imitative, it, it, as long as it's a, a general likeness, but a range of sizes, something like a pheasant. A pheasant tail was designed to, to make catching fish on nymphs easier. It, it's a great imitation of a whole gamut of insects. So we're talking about a fly there that, that you could just go out and nymph with box pheasant tails and have confidence that if those fish are nymphing, you'll catch them. Um, with regards to the, the kind of amount of materials, yeah, again, it, it would be a bit of a minefield, just as we talked about with the lines, and it always used to make us laugh in the, in the shop in Farlow's. People would stand in front of our tippet wall, which was maybe 25, 30 feet long and six foot deep. And you could see people's brains just turn into mush because it's like, what, what do I buy? <laughs> There's 100 square feet of tippet and leaders here. I've no idea what to buy. So I think it's really important that A, um, uh, people in shops, the staff who are working in shops know about this stuff and can really help people and figure out what it is people want. And B, that there's plenty of good information on the internet so that people who are buying from their front rooms rather than from, from the shops uh are, are are getting the stuff that they need rather than receiving something going out and fishing with it and getting frustrated with it yeah yeah um, it's, it's a very yeah go on paul sorry pete go on no i well, i was just going to add something on the back of that um whilst i'm sort of geeky about insects i'm i'm not a, a you know a, a fly tire who's tying realistic flies i'm very much of the suggestive camp i mean uh what andy just said uh Pretty much nailed it. You, you can tie a hair's ear 
and it could it could pass off depending where you fish it in the water column if you fish it down on the stream bed it's a shrimp a hog louse a case caddis yeah if if it's on a lightweight hook up in the surface it's an emerger i i'm definitely more of your suggestive school of fly tying a busy sort of um buggy looking insect rather than an out and out exact replica because if you tie I'm just off the top of my head, a Betis nymph, uh, you know, with six legs and three tails and, uh, you know, all its sexual appendages or whatever you want to add to it. Um, that's what it imitates and that's it. Yeah, you put something on it could to, to the trout or grayling, it might pass as several different food items. Yeah, I'm absolutely with you there. I think it's Ollie Edwards, wasn't it? Was suggest was did he mention suggestive yeah, stuff well, earlier? Well, on? It was again a revolution at one point, and and you've got to admire that kind of fly tying. I mean, when you look at those things in glass cases, and th they're, they're absolutely stunning. Um, but again, it's time investment. Do I want to spend an hour tying a fly and then lose it on the bloody stream bed second or third cast? You know. Um, I uh, yeah, yeah. I know that as a former fishing guide that, you know, I always like at least the fly to get a chance to get wet before it goes in a tree. So that's all I ever ask. So, and that hasn't always happened as well. So that's been kind of oh, interesting. Oh, but I'm familiar with that one, Pete. <laughs> right. Well, let's, let's take this in a, a slightly different direction now. And in again more so from myself and Paul but also Andy as well that we've seen this move towards catch and release more now and people wanting to put fish back which you know has has always I guess happened but more so people would take fish and eat them and and go from there but also the the handling of fish um, seems to have improved and you know in very recent times the keep them wet or keep fish wet now as they're they're now called and and making sure you have wet hands which is obviously really important um, i'm going to go out here and I'm, I'm sure people agree that i'd like to state that i think grayling look better with the dorsal fin not being lifted up by somebody that's my humble opinion but for me you know there's still a lot of stuff i don't necessarily agree with but i don't always know that we always need to call it out in that sense that we lead and all of us use social media and we're going to come on to that but do you think it's better to lead by example rather than calling people out or should we because we are a small community um, we're all on the same side I guess people fish for the same reasons we do perhaps they don't fish as regularly as we do but where should we be with this? And Yeva, perhaps you'd like to answer this one first. Where, where do you stand on that? Because I guess since you've been fishing, catch and releases has been pretty much the norm. Um, where do you where do you feel we should be with this at the moment? Um, and that that whole sort of debate, really. I think it's definitely no need to well, perhaps educate rather than point out to people how awful they are for doing a certain thing. Um, I think keep them wet uh, movement in itself kind of created confusion for me at least because I think everyone was under the assumption that people cannot at any circumstance take the fish out of the water because all they see is keep them wet. They don't go into to read the whole thing to say that it's to minimize the handling of the fish outside of water that you can just do a very quick lift, put the fish back, that's it. So I think that went into, at least I was getting quite a bit of um, comments or uh, little digs on social media saying well why is the fish out of the water well I, you can watch the video back the fish wasn't out of the water for more than three seconds like it's fine i'm sure that fish swam away spot on um so on that aspect i think it's a very good movement i do think a lot of people um are supporting it but i do think that it had to be or well, there has to be still a bit more educating on what the movement actually is about that it's not just never take the fish out of the water um, because I think a lot of people are under that assumption, judging from the comments that I'm getting. Um, and then on the grayling thing, I, I definitely agree with you. I think I don't like the hypocrisy of things. I don't like how people go on trout fishing, keep them wet, don't take them out of the water, handle them as much as possible, handle them as little as possible. And then when it comes to grayling, yank on, a, yank on a bloody fin on every single photo. It's so wrong. If you look after one fish and you promote that fish handling, don't do it the other way to a grayling. What has a grayling done to you? It's still a fish. Yeah, that's a good point. Andy, Andy, what do you think? 
Well, as you say, Pete, it's changed a huge amount and it's probably changed inside a generation. I look back at when I first started um, fishing, going out with my dad, and he would always say, if you get a nice whale, you knock it on the head because they taste better. And you, you look back and you think, oh, God, what were we doing? But, you know, this, is, this has changed in 20 years, this, this, this attitude. Um, and, and it's a great thing. Yeah, any, any kind of education for people about how to handle these fish correctly is brilliant. We, we're talking about, uh, we, we probably fish for some of the most delicate fish in the UK. When you talk about trout and grayling, you maybe put pike in there as well because they're a very fragile fish. But they, they are, these are delicate things. We need to be careful with them. As you ever said, we cop a little bit of flat because we, we do grip and grins. Um, we're super careful with it. We're, we're still the only people I've really ever seen walking around a river with an unhooking mat. Um, and I'm, I'm confident that what we're doing is okay and it's working fine. But there is definitely a, a kind of half general generational change here towards uh, wild fish. I think people respect wild fish more. I think all the efforts being made to clean these rivers, to sustain the clubs, uh, Barber's Hooks is a brand new thing. Um, it, it's all being done to minimise the impact that we have on these environments. And I, I think that's great. I think that, that creates a really sustainable sport um, uh, that people can look at from the outside who don't fish and say, well, actually, uh, yeah, these guys are putting hooks in these creatures. And, uh, you know, should they or shouldn't they? But the rest of what these guys do is very clean, very tidy. And actually, you can see through the investment in the environments and through the care that's taken by people like Paul doing book hands and stuff like that. Uh, fly anglers are actually good for their environment. And that's really important. I think it's something we should be very proud of and keep building on. Yeah, I think that's, you know, anglers as a whole, we do care about our quarry. Sometimes people don't always understand um everything and i always again you know and we're all the same in this that we're a uh, circle of friends are largely anglers who get what we get and feel what we feel but as i've said on podcast before that not everyone is fishing every single day not everyone is looking at social media so they may not necessarily know these sorts of things but we've seen uh, as you say andy paul and i we've, we've seen a a big change in things haven't we where like you say it was perfectly you know people would knock a fish on the head and and, and that was it and there, there has been a big change Paul hasn't there yeah um yeah what Andy's saying it's happened in a generation again I can remember being a kid and it, it, it seemed that you hadn't had a good day unless you you'd got your bag limit kind of thing you know and thankfully those days are, are, are gone um and we have ultimately, I mean, Andy's right, wild fish always taste better, or Andy's dad was right, they always taste better. And, um, you, you know, the, we only have to look at what's happened with um, salmon. I nearly said salmon then, that bad habit. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, when I was a kid, it, it seemed there was a, you know, an endless supply of these fish. And sadly, through death by a thousand cuts, um, that we know where we're at today. And in that bygone era, people just killed at will. Um, and we've had to change our ways. And, and it's for the good of not just the environment, but our sport as well. Um, you know, there is, there's a definite been a big, big shift as well. I, I cut my teeth on wild fish. I was very lucky and eight ounce fish you know and I then got into an angling club and stocked waters and there was these really big things swimming around you know and you thought bloody hell I'll have a bit of this like you know and then that kind of wanes and you you know I've got I've, I've done sort of full circle gone through all, all that not not that there's anything wrong with catching stockfish I mean that that's quite an important part uh, of uh, of our fishing sort of community to have that um I won't digress into that, but it's quite important. Um, but yeah, on the fish handling, I, I, I try. I agree with you. Eva. It's no good. We could all. I, I I could go on social media now, as we all could, and I could show you dozens of bad examples of poor fish hand, handling. Um, it, there's a lot of negativity out there. I prefer a positive slant. And absolutely, yeah, that's right. Is lead by example and and we need to educate people we, we can all point the finger and say you shouldn't do this you shouldn't do that you know but invariably i find people 
tend to respond better to a carrot rather than a stick. Well, I did anyways as a kid, you know, so um, uh, that, that's the way I'd like to do it. And I, I'd like to think, you know, when, 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 I mean, we're hunters, but fishing is technically it's hunting. And as a kid, I, I was ruthless. So we've had this discussion over a beer pee uh, and we're very much alike uh, in that sense. The, we didn't have devices and things. You went out and you had a catapult and you killed animals and things like that. And um, it sounds awful now, but part of that was being inquisitive to have a look at that animal and open, if it was a, a, a bird, open its wing and its beak and its eye and look at it. And what I'm leading up to, part of our angling enjoyment is, yeah, fooling the fish, that's a big kick, but just to look at your prize and admire it for a minute is to me that that's a bit of a big kick and especially when you get a, an old war horse of a trout and you think by god he's he's been through the wars and things like that and you know we should be able to just take a snap and share it with people what what is wrong with that so long as we do it as we've discussed keep try and keep them wet and and very quick uh, you know, I, I see photos of people with fish on grassy banks or away from the river. Uh, th that's wrong, but we shouldn't really, as I say, be, be, be going off on one with them. We should be sort of politely saying, look, in future, just net the fish, just have it by the water, quick snap and, and fish away, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good point. It's, it's interesting everyone sort of agrees on that as well. And, and it is, you know, as you all know with the magazine we do the same and we put the keep fish wet principles in the back and we don't have those sorts of so many um we don't really have grip and grins in there as well so um to try and see if that affects people in in different ways and with the social media that i put out i try my best when i can to make sure that we have those sorts of images without preaching and i, I think that's we're all on the same team and that's the important thing to remember and um looking ahead i hope that is and people either listen to this or see things and think oh actually and i know you guys all how you take photographs is interesting different and does the fish justice um in a in a way that doesn't harm it so that's really cool to hear and um i thought i'd move on really to about information it was interesting um, some of the stuff you ever mentioned about fly tying and stuff like that. And, you know, a little while back, it was harder to get this. But now it's great. And I don't know if this is one of the boosters behind this so-called golden age that we're talking about. It's about getting information. We're going to come on to social media. I really want to talk more about the Internet as a whole at the moment. And now it's much easier to gain access to fishing, to find out about fishing, learning how to fish you know as instructors we um can now learn actually if you've never picked it up and i've mentioned on here before that people who i found who've never picked up a fly rod before have watched some youtube stuff and got a good understanding of how to cast even tracking down a guide or instructor it used to be word of mouth in our day um pool but now it's easier to talk about and Andy particularly with your guiding business you've really embraced it and I'm going to throw it across to Paul in a second as well and and Yeva perhaps if you you've used some thoughts on this but to you first Andy who's built a guiding business and I know we first really started talking when you started guiding really and I've always tried to talk with people who are setting up a guiding business but with the internet now, it's so much easier to reach people um, than in the olden days, I guess, where you had an advert or word of mouth. Do you think that sort of moment now is to build a reputation, to build a business now, right now, if I was starting, would be much harder to do because it's a, a bigger marketplace or is it easier? What do you think, Andy? Oh, well, well I, think, I think there are there are kind of two different questions in there. I think possibly the first question you're asking is easy is, is it easier to set up with you not having to go through those traditional kind of paper marketing channels? It's something actually I mentioned in, in, in the podcast we did a while ago. I've never had to put an advert in a magazine. I, I've, ne I've never had an advert in a magazine. It's just not something that I've had to do. Whereas I look back, I've still got some of dad's old copies of Trout and Salmon. And they all, then the classified section is, you know, these little square boxes. Yeah, I think it was two inch by two inch, wasn't it? And you you put as many words in it as you possibly could. It, 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 those days are over, is, is, is the reality. We've got this amazing 
uh, search tool, the internet, that we can fill with as much information as possible. And people are driven towards social media channels as well. Um, so in terms of setting up, yeah, I think it's much, I think it'd be much easier to do it now than it was when you guys did it. Definitely, 100%. Is it easier to build a reputation? Uh, I, I'm, not sh- I'm not sure it is. Um, I'm not going to say it's harder. I'd say it's different. I think, I think the internet is a brilliant tool for positivity. It is a ruthless tool for negativity. And, uh, you know, if, if, if someone has a bad experience with a product or with a company or with a something or other, within 24 hours, it's all over the Internet. And any reputation you've built can be getting dragged back down into the gutter pretty quickly. So I, th- I, think, I think what the Internet creates is a great tool for building, but a very, very fine line in terms of sustaining a reputation. So um, in, in a way that perhaps before wouldn't, you know, if you chap who, who booked you in a magazine had a bad day, he could go and tell his mates, but that's probably as far as it would go, whereas now it would be all over TripAdvisor, all over Facebook, and that, that could be a real battle. Touch wood, it's not happened yet, but I think, I think possibly the internet, because, it, because it's a, an information tool, it could possibly actually make it slightly more difficult to sustain a reputation. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, for you, you guys run the IB and Andy um, fishing channel on on YouTube. You have ten thousand subscribers. Do you find that a lot of that is is that sort of positive feedback that you're getting? But do you still sort of kind of get that negative stuff from people who just want to do it for the sake of it and put put negative stuff for the sake of it? You know, my favorite comments, like you're saying to Andy, are. The comments that start, I don't want to criticize you, but <laughs> they're the best comments. And I think I had one yesterday as well in my last video where I was using an indicator rig and they were like, well, it's not really fly fishing, is it? It's not fly fishing. And I think um, with YouTube, it's very easy to be negative, very easy to criticize because everything is anonymous. You can't, there's no face, there's no name to it. You can say whatever you want. You can be very mean. We, thankfully, we don't get many of those. We're very lucky that most of it is really positive. Um, and some of it, like from people that uh, followed us from lure fishing side, now are people like still watching our fly fishing videos and they're joining fly fishing and like we can follow their journey as we go along. Usually we have a really nice community built there. And I think we're really lucky in that sense. But just to touch on the information and the internet, I found it really interesting how uh, if I'm looking for something or if I'm asking for advice, all I think I, I need to keep in mind is that that person is going to tell me their favorite thing. It's not necessarily the best thing. Everyone's going to say that like if I'm going to be looking at uh, how to French him or how to tie a fly or how to do whatever, they, they're always going to say this is the best thing to do or this is the, be- the best rod to use. But it's always that person's best thing. And there's going to be a hundred different methods how to uh, tie a rig or how to tie a fly. And I think it's really hard to narrow it down and pick what is right for me, for example. Interesting. And also where you mentioned about an indicator and stuff like that. Well, I've been fishing them a little bit recently and I'm making a fly cast. I'm doing that stuff. It's just a, a, a hark back to days that when I've not done it for so many years. And I really bloody enjoyed it. So um, that was good fun. But Paul, for me, social media as well, the way I think about it sometimes is that it's the equivalent of if you've passed someone in a car and flipped two fingers at them, you can easily drive off again without. And that's how I think about social media in that sense, that you can sort of hit and, and go off and hit hit and runs the wrong term but but um you know you can make that comment and and go away whether it be anonymously be it whatever it is do you think that's something that will continue i guess it probably does doesn't it because it's a microcosm of life but but what do you think about these 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 issues me yeah what 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 issues Uh, the guiding issues all of those actually now that we've we've talked about the guiding issue setting up because again you know i think it was 15 years ago when we first did those a app guy things and it was a different place then and you oh, have the adverts 2006 i think i looked at my first um certificate and uh, i think it i think it was 2006 
I may have um, been a couple of years before because I think I'd just done mine when you first came, hadn't I? So I think uh, Lee, Paul. Yeah. Sorry, did you say 15 years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago? I think it was 15. I was just coming up. I was 39 and I'm 54 now. So yeah. I was just yeah. coming up. Yeah. So I, I wanted to. Wanted to do it for my forties, but there's been that massive change, hasn't there, in, in that side of it? And so um, the internet has been a big part of that with websites and everything else. And we, as Andy said, you could have those adverts in a magazine and potentially reach people. But also, it was other guides, and as you know, we used to speak, Jim, Nick, we all used to speak to each other, so we all knew who was doing what, and we would recommend people as a result of that. That's that's happening, but on a wider basis now, I guess. Yeah, well, first of all, I was guiding before I took my um, AAP guy exams uh, or casting uh, certificates, and uh, that that really just came about because in, in that day, I don't know, I'm hearing things now that uh, certain individuals um, uh, think that – you know, qualifications are rubbish, blah, blah, blah. Well, that, that that's fine. I just, for me personally, felt compelled to have some grounding and understanding. I, I was lucky that I'm quite well hand-eye coordinated and, and picked up casting quite easily, but didn't under, understand the mechanics and whys and wherefores, Pete, which is why I went down the uh, AAP guy route. And met a lot of people like yourself wonderful wonderful people and there was there was a sort of gang of us jim fern jim williams lee cummings yourself brett brett o'connor and we all sort of bounced off each other met up and cast and sort of uh moved things forward for for all our personal developments but um on the guiding thing i came away from it kind of burnt out did did a stint and I, you know, I admire what Andy's doing. It, 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 it takes a lot of doing, does that, and, and to do it day in, day out. Um, yeah, you can put shots up and say, this is my office, and that is great, but there are periods, whether you agree or disagree, that sometimes it, it, it just becomes overwhelming if you get a really difficult client and it's a really tough conditions and they're expecting magic, you know, and and you can come home really beat up because you think, God, you know, um, we, we didn't get a fish or, or whatever. And, and you take it personally, um, or, or I used to. Um, and I moved away from it. I'm, I'm actually doing quite a bit of guiding now. I, I haven't sort of gone out there and advertised it. it strangely enough, it, it, it tends to be word of mouth stuff, um, the good old fashioned way kind of thing. And one or two people coming back to me. Same with the fly tying. I'm, I'm, I'm tying for... Um, uh, a small customer base at the moment, and again, that that that's just word of mouth. But um, it it's just changed massively. I mean, you you've got to, and I know we're coming up to social media. You've you, you, to do what Andy's doing. It, 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 there is a fine line between this good reputation, bad reputation, and you've just got to put yourself out there and be be at you know at the front of it on the internet, projecting, projecting, projecting. And that's where I fall down. You said it in the opening gambit, or we had the WeChat before we, we 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 came live. I don't fully understand it all, and uh, I have periods I, I I like it, then I hate it, and I I really struggle with that side of it. And I I think that's just an age thing. It's not that I'm a technophobe, you know. Sometimes I go fishing, I have a great day. I don't even take photos. I don't post anything. I just want to keep that personal for me. Um, you know, some of the places I go to, some of the fish I catch. I just, I just want it in there, uh, and that, that's important to me. Uh, one of my gripes, I'm digressing a bit, is people always posting from the riverbank. To me, fishing's quite sacred. I, I maybe this has been old-fashioned and old git or whatever, but my fishing, I grew up where it's sacred. You go fishing, and that, that, that's kind of it. Yeah, sure, do all whatever you want to do when you get back, but when I'm fishing. I'm fishing and that's it. I don't want interruptions. I, I, I just want to enjoy my time by the river. Um, really cool point. And I, I was similar. And I think that harks back to my guiding days that when I'd been out because, and we'll come back to you, Andy, on this very quickly as well, but I wanted to show people I was working. I wanted to show them we'd had them out. So usually what would happen is when I came back home, 
the fir- or one of the first things I do is <laughs> this is going back download the pictures or put the the card in the computer and and upload the pictures if that's the right term and do those sorts of things just to show and that's carried through into my personal fishing now that yes I'm with you that I put those images up when I get home there's nothing sort of live it doesn't matter if it isn't but I'm similar to you that I'm fishing right I've got a snap of the fish or there's a beautiful one of me and the dog or Emma casting or whatever but it usually will only go up at the end of the day but Andy that's an interesting one that that Paul said that you know about the guiding and the the burnout and you're doing a lot of days and I know you know I remember days when I'd do 15 days without a breather and you're still smiling but you're bloody knackered but it, it is a, a an interesting, fascinating road to go down, isn't it? And it, it looks as though you're you're really thriving in it. I um I I haven't really experienced, and I've spoken to plenty of people who have, I haven't really experienced the burnout. I I, I, I love guiding. I absolutely love guiding. I love fishing, I love being by a river, I love being in the process. I've I've said before. I, it doesn't matter to me if it's not me that's catching the fish, just the the process, the stalk, finding that rising fish, getting the client in the right spot. Can we work out the drift? Can we work out the fly? Um, I did 23 days on the bounce, May and June this year. On day 24, I got up in the morning, tied some flies and went fishing myself. Because I just I just, I just, just wanted to get back out there. I just wanted to see it again. Cause, you know, a couple of days where the, the hatch was changing and and what the hell are they feeding on? I've got a tie size 18 this. I'll try size 16 as well. Will it will it work without the hackle? Will it work with the hackle? I haven't experienced that. I'm, I'm very, very lucky in that I have my own personal therapist who, who I can get back to after a day's guiding and say, God, I'd be, that was, that was hard today. That was really tough. The wind was howling or um, we were really struggling casting off the, off the true left bank. It was a right hander or, you know, and I can, I can, get that on the system and talk it through with someone who's willing to sit there and listen to that at midnight. Um, and it, I, I find that a real help. I think it'd be much harder if I, if I didn't have you to come and kind of talk about the day. with. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's never really been a thing. If someone offered me 365 days a year of guiding, I'd probably take it. I, I absolutely love it. I absolutely love being out there. I really do. Uh, I know it's not sustainable in the, in the very, very long term, but geez, I, there's nowhere I'd rather be. I've, I've said it to clients before, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll fish the full eight, eight and a half hour day or whatever it is. And we'll get to nine o'clock and they'll say, oh, we we'll probably ought to pack up now, shouldn't we? Why? That's, mm-hmm. Where else would you rather be? I'm, I'm happy if you are. And we just no. fish and fish and fish. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it hasn't really been a thing for me. I'm blessed here with the number of venues. I'm blessed with the number of private venues. So, you know, you're not constantly burning the same places over and over again. So I'm, I'm very, very lucky geographically. Um, but I'd say more than anything, lucky to have uh, someone that I can come and talk about my, my day's work with afterwards. I think that's really important. Cool, cool. Let's go down a really interesting wormhole now. And I saw Marks and Spencers are using influencers to promote their Christmas offerings this year. That's instead of doing a TV advert. And I guess this shows a shift in how retailers are reaching potential purchasers. Um, and I guess we're going to see elements of this going on in fishing, as many other spheres of, of whatever popular pastimes there are as well. Interestingly, though, I've been doing a sort of bit of research in the background and people like Ariana Grande has a huge, huge, I don't know a song, so apologies, but I, it was a name that came up and allegedly 40 percent of her huge amount of followers were bought. Now, I'm I'm told that goes on everywhere um, in high profile um, people, um, and it's a standard thing to actually do. Now, the interesting thing about that is, for me, is that we've just had the election result come through and in the US, and Kanye West was standing and with a big reach potentially. And I, I searched, apparently he doesn't do Instagram, but he's got ways of doing that via his wife and everything else. Failed to reach voters. And I think he only polled about 60,000 people. So that makes me think, if if um, Marks and Spencers are doing this sort of stuff, do you think that 
people will buy products because they are being placed. And I understand fully why companies are doing that. It's a cheaper way of advertising. It costs them some products, some gear, whatever it may be. But do you think people are going to be buying products because somebody has a large amount of, of followers? Do you, where, where do we sort of kind of stand on that? And um, Yeva, kick this off for us. Where, where do you think this is in fishing? If this enters our little world, I suspect there might be that that may happen. Where do you stand on this? Where do you think? So I think it's very different. Uh, well, it's a big difference because we talked about this quite a bit, haven't we? Uh, you can see who it's, it's again, I said it in uh, my podcast before. It's very easy to press a like or to press a follow or to write a comment on Instagram. It's not very easy to part with your money and whose opinion you choose to um, acknowledge and respect and follow. So I will often see big accounts reposting the same and, and for example, promoting the same product or not selling something, a product and just having to keep promoting it. While, I don't know, we put a video out saying that's what we sell and we sold out within six hours, not unexpectedly at all. So I think people perhaps are seeing through it all now. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that people are smart enough to see through um, the fakeness of it all if there is... Um, yeah, I just I just hope that people choose who they follow or who where they part with their money and whose opinion they trust. Um, just a little bit more careful, and I think it is the case. Uh, I just don't know why companies wouldn't see through that because it feels like people are seeing it through, but companies will support just for the numbers of it rather than does that person actually have any influence? Because I can guarantee right now that my account where I have loads of more followers then Paul, for example, will never have as much influence as Paul. So Paul will post something to his 3,000, 4,000, whatever, how many people he can reach, and there will be more people that will buy or follow his advice than there will be if I reach 30,000 people with my post. And and that's that's a, only a good thing because he's a really experienced anger. People trust him. I'm just a newbie. So it should be that way. It's just exactly. that a company would, for example, approach me because they think, well, she can reach more people, but do I have the influence with that reach or not? That's the really interesting point. And that's where I guess I was coming with this. And Paul, I know we talked about it the other day. We've had a couple of phone conversations about it. And the term I used was that it's a bit like the Wild West in that sense oh. and whether it settles down. Now, as Yeva says, if you said to me, this is good, I would say it was good. If Andy said to me it was good, I'd know it was good. And Yeva as well, because I know the reviews you do on your YouTube channel are correct and, and independent, which is really important. But Paul, where do you feel, do you think this is something that might settle down and might change a little bit in the next year, two years, whatever it is? That's probably a long time in, in social media, I guess. Well, probably one day's a long time in social media. Um, <laughs> first of all, uh, Yeva, thank you for the, the kind comments, and she put it far, far more eloquently than you did, Pete. Can Yeva not ask the questions? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's a, where where do, where do we begin on this one? Um, I mean, I'm like you, Pete. We've said this, and it's a bit of a cliche, it, it, and you nailed it. That's a great, great analogy. It's like the blinking wild west out there i i fully don't understand it i probably don't use it or maximize the tools uh like i say i can i can have periods I, I just don't want nothing to do with social media for three or four days and then i have a little bit of a spurt and that's not me criticizing people who who are using it every day you know and and it's good that it's there in many respects because we we need it right now in in the circumstances we find ourselves with um you know covid um but influence i mean yeah that's right um it's i suppose i can see tackle companies using i think some of them potentially do use influence influencers but are these i'm assuming that likes are being bought in the tackle industry i don't even know where to begin with that because i'm you know i and yeah there seems to know how many followers i've got and i don't even know how many followers <laughs> God, that's that's, yeah. and that's shocking, really, isn't it? I mean, I some I put ultimately um, 
with influencers, influencers it, it's got to be somebody you would trust and know ultimately in the tackle trade that's that's had a ground in, has served an apprenticeship and come up um, through the ranks. And yeah, arguably you've seen a lot of youngsters. And again, I'm not knocking that. Everybody's got to start somewhere. But ha- have they ultimately got got that depth of knowledge and, and can, can they speak broadly on a subject if you just pull anything out of a hat and say, let's discuss this in terms of fishing? You know, we're, we're, the panel we've got here, if you throw anything out, I reckon we, you, you know, we could be sort of scrapping on who answers it first with their opinion. And I've sat on fishing panels at various events and, and things like that. And there's one or two people who've been there who, who've struggled to have the content to answer questions and things like that. So it's a difficult one because ultimately what we're seeing on Instagram and that, if, if you're very good, um, you, you can project yourself and there's nothing wrong with this uh, and appear to be arguably something you, you're not. I, I, you know, a key example, if, if I was a whiz kid, I could probably set myself up anonymously tomorrow as some kind of, um, well, a politician, for example. You know, there we go. Who, who's to know any different? Yeah. yeah. Would you I agree with that? Yeah, I definitely do. And, you know, this is going down the old old guard route that in the olden days, and I remember when I first, before I did my app guy, I did a couple, two years with another qualification, but also working with Nick as well subsequently. And I remember as pike fishing uh, on in South Devon at Slapton Lee, and he got a phone call from Hardy. And that's when they were starting up their academy then. And that was a really big deal that companies approached you to do that. Now, interestingly, via the magazine, and I know, I have no idea. Emma finds the, the, the builds the, the stuff. I put the content out and I might take something from the magazine. I wrote something this morning, just a few short lines, just to let people know we're out there and this is how we feel about stuff. But I get messages saying we're looking for, for influencers I, from random companies in wherever it is and that's a lot different from that phone call he took then to now and they may look right they've got however many it is i think we got whatever it is it's not a huge amount and like you i don't understand how you buy these things but i wonder if there will be a tipping point where companies realize that if follower numbers are sold a a bought to sell potentially other stuff and it's not working because it's not actually real, then that may be the tipping point where we start to see things change a little bit. But Andy, do you have views on this and, and where you think this sort of stands and whether this sort of thing continues for the time being? Well, I guess marketing is evolving, isn't it? It feels like we've gone away from an old style of marketing that revolved around return on revenue. Oh, you know, oh, I was king and putting an advert in the trout and salmon. How much are we getting back from it? That's, you know, we need to we need to work this out to a visibility based style of marketing. Um, and I don't think I don't think that's anyone's fault. If you were the if you were the marketing director of a global fishing brand and um, you had the opportunity to have an influencer with 60, 70, 80,000 followers who could give you a guaranteed visibility every single week of 100,000 people and you turned it down, your managing director would hammer you. He'd say, why? Why Why have we missed that opportunity? Why are they now, why has why another company now got that visibility that, that we could have had? So actually, I don't think this is anybody's fault. I don't, I, I, I think, I only think it's driven by change. Marketing is changing very, very quickly. And I think, industry as a whole the, the, the whole kind of global industry is is struggling to kind of keep up with it and work out where it is what what we can rely on here is that is that ultimately all of these companies will uh, uh, the end game is black and white are we making money or not and at some point i agree with you pete there's going to be a settling down process where some of these some of these companies look at this and go hang on a minute actually we're providing um a big retainers or a lot of kit or, or, or all this uh, stuff to these influencers. 
are we are we actually getting any return on this? Is this working? Um, it's Henry, Henry Ford said, wasn't it, that ninety uh, percent of his advertising budget is a waste of money, but he has no idea which ten percent works. Mm. Um, and I, I think eventually we'll get to that with this influencer style of marketing. Is 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 this actually providing? sufficient ROI to be sustainable. And if it's not, you can trust business to be black and white on this. If it's not sustainable, if it's not working, it'll go away. If it turns out that we are wrong um, and, and actually the ROI is there, that, that, you know, this is making money, it'll grow. It's going to get bigger. And as um, uh, advertising platforms change, you know, there's no, there's no avoiding it. The magazines are struggling now. And as the magazine struggles, subscription, a good subscription based uh paper marketing big, uh, continues to fall these companies are going to look for alternative ways of advertising their products they've got to and actually the influencer based style of marketing is pretty quick and pretty simple for a company who are looking to diversify the marketing strategy uh, it, it's not going to go away i don't think anywhere in the near future if mns are still if mns have, have committed this amount to, to doing what what you said they're doing that's a, that's a sign there that that this is something that isn't going away the point you've touched on about paid likes is really interesting because the probability is there is is that the roi numbers or or, or the the idea that it might not be working will happen sooner because all of a sudden that visibility doesn't have any value and you'll be able to realize much sooner in the marketing process here actually yeah, yeah, this has been seen by 100,000 people, but we haven't sold anything. And eventually those accounts that are doing that one by one will start will, will start to uh, get pushed away. And eventually, yeah, I agree with you, this will settle down. It's going to take some time and it's going to take marketing as a whole to figure out how it wants to do it. Hmm. Yeah, I guess our marketplace is so small. So that's where it's probably difficult for it to work. You could see it working in a, a big market like the U.S., but to our little marketplace, I'm not 100% sure how that works. But um, one of the things I wanted to move on from, I think we've covered that in a really interesting way. Has anyone got anything else they'd like to say on that before I, I change it? Well, and just what a comment Andy threw out, the, just on the magazines, uh, actually Trout, Trout and Salmon, um, and I believe some of the others are enjoying quite a... Um, upsurge at the moment which are principally thinks down to the environment we're in right now and people have got time on their hands and just want want to read and things like that um i hope that continues because again being an old-fashioned sort it, it's nice having a uh, sort of hard copy in your hand and pages to flick through and things like that um i hate reading things on devices but anyway there we go <laughs> i'm with you on that i'm with you on that um, let's move on then. And I wanted to talk about, uh, conservation and Paul as uh, vice president of the wild trout trust ambassador for salmon and trout conservation trust. The volume t to me, it seems has been turned up about, and let's, let's talk about pollution because, you know, we've talked, I've talked about it on a number of podcasts now. And that volume has been turned up. And I think, you know, the work with and also the, the, the Grayling Society as well and, and the other ones as well, the other NGOs. But um, do you think we are getting to a state where more anglers are being engaged by uh, wanton pollution, by water companies, other practices that are polluting the waterways? Do you think that volume is getting louder and and companies are starting to listen now paul you you kick us off with that one yeah well absolutely i mean I, I, you know back to the social media i mean things are out there is there any pollution incidents just now it's like andy was saying with your reputation as a guide if if you have a stinker of a day everybody sort of knows about it quite quickly well it's the same with with pollution incidents whether it's from uh water companies um landowners or, or whatever um you know, the, the all-seeing eyes out there, we've, we're all carrying cameras and devices, we photograph it and, and you, you know, it's there for everybody to see. Uh, and th that's absolutely right and that's the way it should be. Uh, I'm, I'm going to mention, I don't know him personally, um, I know Yever and Andy definitely won't know him because he, he was an 80s pop star, but Fergal Sharkey 
I admire what he's doing. That That is fantastic. Sometimes I feel a little bit ashamed because we can all get sidetracked. I, like Andy, I have a, an absolute passion and love for fishing and, and I just like being out in the field as much as I can. And something's got to give. You can't. You can spread yourself too thinly, or you can't be in two places at once. And you know, I, I ashamedly, I can take my eye off the ball. And I often think, geez, I should be highlighting more things that are, are wrong in the environment and with the insects and things like that. But fair play to obviously um, Wild Trout Trust, Salmon and Trout Cons, as you mentioned, and River Fly Partnership as well. They weren't mentioned here because they they ultimately were the catalyst. For, for the Smart Rivers project that the salmon and trout conservation are doing now. And it's just that little bit of awareness. And one thing I would say about um, the sort of newbies, uh, if I dare include Lever here, is uh, they seem a lot more switched on in terms of care for the environment. We, we kind of grew up in that generation, Pete, um, rightly or wrongly, where there was a sort of perhaps less respect for the environment and we didn't you know it, it seemed a never-ending supply of x y and z and now now that that them halcyon days have gone and we've really got to protect what we've got and um you know and and that's one good thing with social media and yeah the volume definitely is getting louder on that and hopefully it will continue to get louder yeah um as you know fergal's a guest on here and it was fantastic and i speak to him from time to time about stuff as well and if anyone he's mainly on twitter and if anyone uh isn't following him already just re i try and do it retweet if he's saying he says the stuff that needs to be said and i try and um tag in james bevan from the environment agency in that as well to make sure um he's seeing that and i know for a fact that he is um and it's kind of, and i know he's listened to that podcast as well because i've been told he has um so if we can continue turning that volume up to 11 until something is done it still needs to be that the water companies need to be fined more and then they might start investing in the infrastructure um that's my hope with that but we'll keep pushing that um and in yeva have you anything to add to that as well because obviously you guys are on the river the whole time um is there anything you'd like to add to those comments as well do you know, actually, the first thing I want to do is echo ex exactly what Procky said there. Uh, I, I listen to, I've listened to Fogel's podcast three or four times now. It's one of those ones I'll, I'll put on basically every time I sit down at the vice. And every time I listen to it, I, I have a huge amount of respect and admiration, but this little shadow of guilt on my shoulder saying, you should do as much as this guy. You, you should be doing this much. And we, we were talking, we, we touched on guiding earlier and, burnout and difficulties and stuff like this there is nothing that stresses me out more than the idea of one of those rivers getting polluted because my well my my castle is built on the quality of those rivers um so yeah it's fabulous that people are doing more we we could all do more i, I again i'll let you what procky said uh, i i did my river fly uh last year to be able to to be able to monitor the inverts on the waterways it's, it's, it's the canary in the coal mine isn't it um, but being able to turn up the heat on these big water companies is absolutely vital. And actually, as, as has already been said, one of the great things about social media is that you don't have to write a strongly worded letter anymore. You can tweet James Bevan. You let, you let him know what's going on directly. He can't, he can't avoid it. They can't escape it. As Procky says, we've all got, we've all got cameras in our pockets. It can go straight on Twitter, straight on Facebook. And we, we see it time and time again. Unfortunately, Time and time again, we're still seeing major pollution incidents. Now, I don't know what's going on in Wales at the moment, but it seems like every couple of months, one of those little tributaries is getting whacked. We had incidents uh, actually pretty close to home, didn't we? The upper trend got polluted really badly, huge fish kill. Was it the team um, that got done a couple of years ago? Huge fish kill, great trout river, basically biologically dead by the end of it. Uh, I don't know what the outcomes of those were, but I do know that the outcomes that I've bear witness to in the past, it looks it's specifically talking about the Wandle there, maybe the outcomes aren't good enough, the fines aren't big enough. Uh, I was told that one of the one of the precedent cases is one of the uh, pollution incidents on the Wandle in the early 2000s, for which Thames Water were given a massive fine, which on appeal was reduced to half a year's general employee's salary. 
and that apparently that is one of the precedent cases now for these pollution incidents and if 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 that's if that's how the government is going to stand up to the environment we're all going to have to work a lot harder great excellent um yeva we started this conversation unless you is there anything you'd like to say about this uh, pollution conservation anything along those sorts of lines the only thing I think I would like to say is um, everyone's uh, most of the time, and I think including me as well, will will be very, very quick to blame environment agency. But I do think they so thinly spread thinly mm -hmm. that we all need to support the environment agency a little bit as well and just have their backs when they are fighting cases and angling trust and the fish legal when they are trying to do their best rather than just go on a, or a rant in the comment sections on the environment agency space. Well, you're not doing enough, you're not doing enough, you're not doing enough, you're not doing this. But yeah, definitely, I, I feel mega guilty now sitting here that I'm not doing enough. But I think, yeah, we definitely could do more, especially with social media and making sure we reach as many people as possible. Good points. And it's interesting, isn't it, where we talked about social media and we chatted the, about the fish handling. That's where it's important that we don't fragment our community and we don't call people out because they may be the same people who help us in the fight to um, get our waterways in a better, cleaner shape, I guess, don't we? But let's start. We're almost an hour and a half into this now. So I'm going to start to wind things down now. But um, we started this conversation about uh, talking about fishing as a whole and the state it's in. Um, is it a golden era that we're actually in at the moment. Yeva, I'd like you to kick us off with this about how you feel about the state of fishing as as somebody relatively new, and you're not brand new to this, you know, you, it's five, five, six years you've been fishing now. So you've seen um, a, a little bit um, over a, a few seasons now. Um, how does it feel to you fishing, even in that shortish period of time? How does fishing feel to you right now? And how's it looking? And what are your hopes for it? So I think we can always do more to get more people into fishing. There's never going to be um, enough of things that we can do. Um, definitely promoting fishing outside of the fishing industry. So not just to the same people over and over again. Um, I think we could we could do something clever with perhaps getting people uh, fishing that are uh, coarse anglers or carp anglers, getting them into fly fishing if you want that. Um, but I think overall, I think because of the lockdown and what was happening, a lot of people have joined and a lot of people have started fishing. I just hope that they stick now that our lives are going to get back to normal at some point, if we ever do, um, that they stick to fishing and they keep fishing because it would be great to have these numbers. There's still not enough numbers, I don't think. I think we could do a lot better. Um, I don't know how it used to be or how many people used to be uh, anglers 20 years ago. Um, but I think, again, we're having this false uh, vision of seeing lots of people, lots of, lots of younger people on social media because we are the people that use more social media. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I think overall I'm very positive at the moment just because of that little influx of people that we had um, over lockdown. That's great to hear. Andy, how does it feel? Well, I think you have hit the nail on the head. We're at a period of opportunity here. Um, for, the, for the first time, actually, in a while, uh, specifically for fly fishing, a little period of opportunity here where we are being seen to do the right things environmentally with switch towards uh, more wild and sustainable fishing. Um, uh, I'd be fascinated to find out how many of the pollution incidents that have been reported in the last five years have been reported by anglers. I think I think the AT need that number. That that That, for me, would be really important. You can... You can legitimise the entire industry just by getting that number and proving that we are the guardians of the waterways, which I think we would all agree is probably true. Uh, it, it, it's it's a really funny period, isn't it? As we've talked about, marketing is changing, the way we fish is changing, people's lifestyles are changing. Obviously, 2020 has been one big change. But yeah, I feel I feel like there's opportunity here for, for the whole of fishing. Uh, particularly particularly actually for fly fishing because it gets people a bit further away from real life you know I, I think as fly anglers we're lucky that a lot of what we do is further into the wild than your average course angler I know that's not broad I know it's not true of, of everything but 
a, a thing that's flying with. We're quite lucky. We get to go to places that not many people actually ever get to see. And I think that's really attractive for the public at the moment. I think with the lockdowns and, uh, you know, Angling Trust have done brilliantly to keep fishing uh, on the table during this lockdown that we're in now, um, the November lockdown. So, yeah, I think we've got a real opportunity here. The, the problem is I'm not sure how to best take that opportunity. And I haven't, I haven't really found anyone that is. <laughs> and I'd be really interested to find any opinions from from both of you two guys about how do we how do we grasp hold of this now and, and say to not not only the fishing public but the general public here's something that's so great we bloody love it this is so good and it, it's so good for the environment and so good for your physical and mental health come with us come and do it how how do we how do we engage people now i think for we're going to come on to pool in two seconds but i think basically what is happening you've got the tv program obviously um white house and mortimer i think is doing nothing but good for fishing across the board i think these um uh conservation issues are bringing other people to the table who are saying oh actually what's going on here this looks pretty interesting that's bringing them and i think we might start to see a little bit more of that and one of the pushes i would like to have coming into christmas is try and get this smoked salmon thing sorted out and have a go at the salmon farms as well and i wonder if that's a way of engaging people in a different way in a roundabout way rather than the obvious one and we've got these great schemes out there to encourage people to fish as well at children at school level all the way through as well but i wonder if there's ways to engage people in a wider way and it may be on an ecological level more than anything else but paul i think you, you should be involved with this now as well and but you know we've seen a lot how how does it feel to you and what do you think i i, I think we're in a great place i think at the moment um obviously you you, you well you didn't purposefully steal my thunder but yeah paul whitehouse and bob mortimer i mean that that program you just can't help but like it and it's i'm pleased that it's um broadcast on uh, a major sort of uh, channel or platform on the on bbc um and you know you you just look at bob I, i'm just hoping that joe public see bob how infectious is he with and you you just can't make up his excitement you you couldn't fake that and that's wonderful to see and it just shows that there's a, there's a lot more to fishing than just catching fish as well there's the company and you know we we i know i know certainly you do the same as me pete i hazard a guess that andy does um i often cook meals and brew up and things by the river and that that's a quite an important part of my sort of uh, fishing schedule now if you like it's a bit of a ritual i go through but yeah back back to fishing i mean uh, what white house and mortimer are doing or that series has just been fantastic it's just got better and better we're at series three now yeah just done yeah, uh, just i think, think they've, got... they've got another one on the go have they um, yeah i oh, think they've God. got the green light yeah great that, that's fantastic news um yeah, we discussed social media a wee bit. I think that that's definitely good for us as well, and it's really nice to see uh, the the big big jump or big leap, or uh, if you want to call it, as has been uh, women into fishing over recent years. That that's fantastic, and I think that's um, brought a, a little bit more sort of um, funky style to it um, in terms of of clothing. Now with fishing, um, we've got lots of materials, lots of um, um progression uh and again yeva and andy are probably looking I, I can go back to days and you'll remember pete when we had wax cotton jackets and in cold weather the, the sleeves were stiff and hard and they were horrible and smelly and damp and you know all those kind of things but um all that side <clears throat> all that side of fishing is great i i think we're in a good place just as you ever said there's uh, this year there's been a, a massive injection of people taking up fishing the i suppose the only worrying thing for me is is, is trying to get more youngsters involved these days they're the sort of lured away with devices and things like that that we didn't have and for me i'd i'd be keen uh, again mentioning um bless him charles jardine what he does in terms of bringing youngsters into fishing it's just fantastic and again I, I can feel 
a little bit um, sort of ashamed or embarrassed that he's doing so much. And, uh, you know, we all try and do our wee bit, but he's really sort of picked up the ball and ran with it there uh, and good for him. Uh, but certainly for me, it, it would be a lot more reassuring to see uh, more youngsters coming into it. Um, yeah. I remember as a kid, as you probably do, Pete, you came home from school, you went up the field and terrorised animals or went fishing and, uh, and and that was it, you know. Um, very, very different world we live in. But I think we're in a good place. It seems healthy. Um, for all my sort of bleating about social media, there's a lot of positives on there, you know. Um, just need to find somebody to show me how to use it properly, you know. <laughs> I'll, I'll sign up for the course with you as well if there's a thing there. But it is, it's lovely. And I look forward to seeing pictures from people going out there, enjoying it and having a special day, be it, and it, like you alluded to, Paul, and I think you guys as well, and Ineva, that it's not just the fish, it's that bigger picture of everything that means so much. And it's really thrilling. I love seeing where people are fishing, the images of the river, um, it's not just the fish that that interests me and and it's been brilliant to see that and I'd like to thank you all for being guests on here all for doing so much for fishing as well in such a positive and great way and you all inspire people as well so you should be incredibly proud of that and um, you know just keep doing what you're doing and it's just been brilliant to have you on here to have this really interesting chat um i would like to end and in yeva where can they get hold of you where can they see your youtube channel where can they buy flies tell me that so as i think the easiest thing to do would just be to direct people to the ib and andy fishing channel uh that all of our videos are up there so all the information that people would want is up there or on my website abangling.co.uk nice and simple Perfect. Thank you, Paul. You said you're guiding now. You're tying some flies. Um, if you've got, I, I guess people have got to write you a letter these days to get hold of you rather than. <laughs> Not just a letter. It's got my carrier pigeon as well, Pete. <laughs> and everything else. I only deal with pigeons. Um, yeah, just on on probably the easiest avenue um, or the quickest, or probably monitor most is Facebook. So that's just just my personal account anybody can uh send me a message on there it's probably the best avenue that's where most of it comes from at the moment uh there'll be some changes for me after christmas in terms of a bit a bit more sort of going public with with that side of things and guiding again fantastic well thank you everyone so much for being such great guests i think we covered loads um, in a good, positive way, we've 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 talked about some interesting stuff and covered some interesting stuff and been open and and honest and transparent about it, which I think's really really cool. So I'd like to thank you all for being a guest on the Fly Culture Podcast again. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, folks. Cheers, Pete. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for listening to the Fly Culture Podcast. I hope you've enjoyed this one as much as me. Plenty more coming, so um, they'll be released very, very soon. But thank you, everyone, for listening to the podcast.